A very good morning and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. Welcome to today's Hindu news analysis where we shall be analyzing all UPSC relevant articles from today's The Hindu publication, the New Delhi edition. This is for 20th April 2024. So in today's newspaper, apart from the ongoing Lok Sabha elections, there are a couple of newses which we shall break down from the perspective of UPSC mains and these need a detailed breakdown. So these are very diverse in nature. They range from talking about how the government seems to be using our Divasi agenda or the government is using tribal empowerment as an agenda to win more and more seats in the upcoming elections. That is what certain experts are claiming. Another news comes from the science segment where we talk about how scientists and policy makers in India are requesting the upcoming government, whosoever will form the government, there is a request to them to create a larger, a more systematic infrastructure to promote innovation and R&D in India. The third article here talks about forests, you know, in another milestone judgment. The Honorable Supreme Court has said that forests are national assets and we cannot do anything to infringe upon their territory. In fact, we should promote better forest for better climate mitigation. On that note, we have about say five articles which are very factual and they need a quick analysis from the prelims perspective. So these range from how a new fossil has been discovered in the area of Kutch to how India has delivered the BrahMos missiles to Philippines. Now, this is important in the light of the ongoing China Sea conflict. And then we talk about how one of the unique tribal communities of Andaman and Nicobar have casted their vote for the first time in the ongoing 2024 Lok Sabha elections. And of course, we will talk about the new Aganwadi curriculum as well as how Israel finally decided to respond to Iran's attack and it has in turn launched some explosions on Iran. So let's talk about certain future developments and the ongoing tussle between the two. On that note, let's begin our discussion on the first article for UPSC mains. This relates to social justice, but it also relates to GS paper 2 polity. So we are talking about how there is an ideological battle that's going on between on the one hand the tribal community leaders and on the other hand various political parties now the tribal community leaders feel that political parties suddenly are showing a lot of enthusiasm about tribal problems and tribal history all political parties are trying to use adivasi or tribal identity just as a sop to win more and more sympathy, to win more and more vote banks among the tribal people. So this is what the article debates about that when political parties start using tribal issues as an election agenda, does that mean that we are somewhere foregoing the real problems that tribals in India face? The article is more or less a case study because we are talking about a certain tribal belt that is situated in southern Rajasthan and this tribal belt is surrounding the areas of Udaipur, Banswara and Dhungarpur. Now this particular tribal belt has also been in the news ever since we entered January 2024 for various reasons and here also the article says how this particular tribal belt is inhabited by the largest. Now do remember as per the 2011 census of Indian population, the Bhils are the largest tribal community in India. And this particular belt of southern Rajasthan houses many Bhil Adivasi people. It's a hamlet where many community members of the Bhil tribal group are residing. And in particular, the article highlights a political group that has been made by the Bhil people that is referred to as the Bharat Adivasi Party. And this represents the sentiments of Bhil community with regards to demanding a separate Bhil state. Now, often we talk about how deprivation, marginalization and cultural marginalization have led to demands of separatism. We've also spoken about the Kamtapur Liberation Organization, the KLO that's housed in Eastern India, particularly Assam area. In many such case, cases, you know, wherever the tribal communities have felt segregated, they feel that their needs are not being met. 
Nothing much has been done for their social economic development by the recurrent governments. They often resort to demanding a separate state to get their aspirations met. And this is the critical case here that the Bharat Adivasi Party, which is the representative of Bheel community sentiment, the party was created so that there is a demand for a separate state, not only for the Bheel people, but also the history, the unique heritage of Bheel people can be registered better. The government should do something for their better economic social development as well as political participation. So therefore, this party has emerged as a force in a very short period of time. It has seen support from a lot of tribal communities inhabiting Rajasthan. Even the non bheel groups have been supportive. And this has been used as a very good opportunity by the mainstream political parties. The article is pointing out at both to the BJP RSS narrative as well as to the Congress narrative that how various political parties have been coming in this area ever since the 2023 election year campaigning kind of rolled out. During this time, most of the political parties were coming to this area. They were showing a very pro-tribal sentiment. Now, if the sentiment is purely for the sake of development, it is to be appreciated. But here, the local people feel that the sentiment is being used as a vote bank trick by the political parties, which is often the case in India. Caste, tribe, gender, minority religious communities, these are certain identities that are always used as vote banks. It has been something that has been going on for a very long time now. So this is the rhetoric of the article here. Now let's also remember that back in 2023 assembly election, the BAP or the Bharat Adivasi Party, the representative of the Bheel community, it won three seats in Banswara and in the Dungapur district. It won with a clear majority. Now this means that the party is also now enjoying a lot of political prestige in the area. Since its support base is growing in southern Rajasthan, the demand for a separate state for the Bheel community is also now increasing. Now one of the very big reasons why people are supporting this party, the tribals are very very supportive of this organization is also because certain promises it has made. For example, 75% reservation for the Bheel community members in education and state government jobs. So naturally it is promising a lot of development but this is one thing the entire prestige commanded by this party is then in turn being used by the major national political parties how the main concern that the article highlights is that the union government very often via the national commission for scheduled tribes is trying to completely change the discourse on tribals and how are they trying to do that for example today the government is repeatedly saying that all along whether it be the santhal rebellion whether it be the ho rebellion whether it be the whole issue of Bheel resistance movement. Today, the government claims that all these tribal insurgency or resistance movements were aimed at either the British colonial government and its atrocities, its very, very discriminatory policies, or all these were targeted against local communities when they were fighting with each other. The government is not really recognizing that many, many times the fight of these tribal people was also against the domination of upper caste Hindus and the upper caste dominated money lender community. So these were also the people who were associated with tribal exploitation. But this discourse is never mentioned by the government because the government only wants to complain and put the entire blame of tribal backwardness on colonial policies without truly really assuming any responsibility from its own side. This is the sentiment among the local people. So the local people feel that this kind of biased issue is completely changing the narrative and the history experienced by the indigenous people. So therefore the BAP, this particular Bheel party, says that this is kind of snatching away or appropriating our identity itself because outsiders cannot decide our history. It is we the tribal members who know better what has been our ancestry. So BAP's effort are therefore today aimed at producing a counter narrative, a very opposite narrative to that which is being constructed by major political parties including the BJP and the RSS who say that tribals have always fought against external people, whether it be the British or whether it be 
other invaders in India, but it has always been against outsiders. They are not ready to understand that caste-related complexities were a major reason why tribals experienced backwardness. Now, even if they lost their livelihoods because of British pro-industrialization and pro-development agenda, Majority number of times they ended up suffering because they were very lowly placed in the caste spectrum in the villages. They experienced untouchability. Many times they had to borrow money from upper caste landlords and money lenders who then completely subjugated them and they forced them into bonded labor for generations contributing to a high degree of gender crimes and intergenerational poverty. So what about that? What about when in the villages it is the always dominant caste members who are the major perpetrators of atro atrocities against Adivasi Mahilas, against snatching their lands and not allowing them access to village infrastructure. So why are the oppressors not pointed out? Why only because they are the upper caste Hindu community people? So this is also something that the article tries to question. So therefore, the party and the local people are complaining that such narratives created by the government during the time of election are kind of hiding the real nature of tribal life and complexity. They are also ignoring the struggles of social economic development and cultural autonomy that tribal people constantly battle against. So this is by and large the sum total of the article. The article also feels, the article is also saying that the local tribal people are feeling that Today, the government is coming to tribal hamlets. The government is trying to show a lot of respect for tribal ancestors. See, for example, very often we talk about Birsa Munda. Often we talk about the honorable, the great tribal leader from the area of eastern India, from the area of Jharkhand. So there also, often the government has showed a very enthusiastic support towards celebrating the Jayanti in memory of all the successful and heroic tribal leaders, but why suddenly so much empathy? Why suddenly so much support? So could this be nothing but a pre-election agenda? Could it be to get a lot of support from tribal voters and not really something that's being done to promote empowerment of the vulnerable tribal communities, given the fact that around 8.6% of people population of India is composed or comprised of tribals as per the 2011 census. When you compare this data with the amount of contribution the tribal communities are having in government jobs at political level, you can clearly see the discrepancy. So therefore, today a lot of oppression is even now coming from caste-based discrimination and economic exploitation, which is again very casteist in nature. So therefore, colonial rule was not the only problem responsible for historic exploitation of these tribals. And that's something that today people like the BAP party members and the local educated members are trying to propagate. They are also saying that let us celebrate the grassroots or the local level efforts that were created, that have been created by Adivasi activists to reclaim the identity and pride among tribal members. The article is giving a special acknowledgement to individuals like Jitendra Meena and Bandhantiga for their efforts to challenge the narratives that are being created by today's national political parties who are refusing to understand that it is the caste complexities, it is the historical caste biases that are coming in the way of complete tribal development. So unless we understand the real nature of the problem, there is no use simply blaming colonial policies or only blaming one aspect of the problem. So the tribals should have every right to create their own narrative because when we talk about the post-modern or the post-modernism ideology, we understand that every individual, every community, every group has a right to create their own narrative based on their experiences. So you cannot ignore subaltern realities. So that is something that the article is trying to pitch for. With this, we can proceed with the second article that is highlighted on page 8. It is coming from GS Paper 3 Science and Technology. We are talking about how today's India is very different from the kind of ecosystem that we spoke about, say, 20 or 10 years from before. Today, we are talking about an India 
whose economy is galloping to almost about to being the third largest in the world. We are talking about a country which has great potential for state-of-the-art technology like AI. We are talking about a country which is not only spending but also creating major innovation in its defense sector, in its pharmaceutical sector. Now, people often say that India is the pharmacy of the world. We often also talk about how AI is being actively used in agriculture, in education. In this scenario, there is one thing that's lacking, however. So the article complains that even today, when India's science and tech, rather the IT segment is booming, there is one loophole. And that loophole is coming in the form of poor investment in R&D and innovation. So if India is emerging as a new technical hub, a new technological hub, then we also probably need more support from the government at every level. And this has to start from the college level itself. So across academia, across various universities and laboratories, if the government is ready to support financially, as well as, in other ways, better research and development, much better innovation, then probably it would mean wonders for a developing, rather, a newly developed country that's india so that's what the article pitches for it is almost coming like a request it's coming like a wish that's being made by young scientists in india to who to the government or rather to the political party who shall from the gov who shall be forming the new government of india post the electoral results in 2024 so the article begins by saying that there are typically five issues which are something of a concern and whichever government forms its rule at the center a decent request is there to that government that please listen to these five fundamental issues that the scientists are very concerned about and do emphasize on these to create a better research infrastructure in the country one of the issue is increasing spending on research and development so we need to fund better our r d sector so scientists are saying that we need to spend more not only from government's money but also we need to create a ppp model we need to have private sector corporate entities who are willing who are absolutely ready to chip in finances for better research and development now a very good way could be a linkage between academia and industry for example the leading multinational corporations which actually are present in huge number in india so these companies could have continuous systematic tie-ups with technical institutions and itis industrial training institutes in india so that on an ongoing basis every academic year there can be more research and development that's made possible with students themselves being encouraged to take up r d with guidance from the mncs on a paid basis so that would be very very encouraging indeed also the article highlights the data it says that india's spending on research and development today is below 0.7 percent of its gdp now this is abysmally poor it's very very less as compared to many other industrialized countries so therefore it should be at least about say four percent of the gdp by the end of the new government's term so in the next five years we should see this investment galloping to at least up to more than four percent so that's an ideal thing that the scientists wish for the second thing that the article has highlighted is that we need to improve our infrastructure in the public sector institutions very well said because we all know that although we have been trying to become a meritocratic society to get admissions in higher technical colleges. We have elaborate assessments. We should have elaborate and a very enriched academic background. But once the students are eligible to enter in any technical institute of higher learning, it is often observed that private colleges and universities offer a much better infrastructure as compared to their government counterparts. So therefore, the cream de la cream of society, rather the economically well-off segments of society would always take up private sector institutes over government sector institutes. Why? Because naturally, when it comes to basic infrastructure facilities, they are quite lacking behind in the public sector. So therefore, not only the physical and intellectual infrastructure, but also research-oriented encouragement should improve for students and young scientists in all public and government finance institutions. The focus should also therefore extend to better pedagogy, which means we need to have much higher 
quality of teaching staff available in these universities so that there can be a better guidance for the students in just next five years if we double the number of highly qualified teachers or mentors then possibly the research possibilities will also increase major majorly now the next point that the article talks about is focusing on merit in hiring it's the scientists are claiming that it's very very important that we should have a very clear transparent and a merit based process of hiring teachers staff and other mentors other professional working staff in education and research institutions it should not be done in any bureaucratic fashion it should be very very merit based so therefore the globally acceptable standards which are being followed in the state of the art universities across the world the best of them those standards should be also followed in indian universities and research centers so that only competent candidates get a job here and therefore they are able to guide the upcoming students in a much better way similarly the article also pitches for a more systematic and more regular streamlined grant management there is a need for a better grant management system to facilitate research financial grants should not be an issue they should not be an impediment for young scientists to take up more research projects so therefore red tapeism unnecessary governmental delays unnecessarily bureaucratic procedures and unnecessary obstacles in timely disbursement of grants should be completely stopped in fact recently there was an article in the hindu just about say two weeks back where we spoke about how higher institutions in india will do well if you give them more and more internal autonomy let them take their own decisions at least when it comes to financial management and curriculum so this is something similar that this article is also trying to ask that let's allow more and more autonomy in granting fellowships in granting scholarships to individual scientists out of research funds and then the article ultimately talks about academic freedom that scientists are asking for more academic freedom which means whatever opinions whatever problems whatever discoveries they make they should be allowed to host them freely they should be al allowed to announce them freely in that case more encouragement shall be provided and only when we allow young scientists to openly express their new discoveries and researches only if we respect and we are inclusive towards them only then we can find better solutions to various problems across industry so they also highlight autonomy given to these scientists to engage in business or self employment entrepreneurship it should also be taken care of that these institutions are ready to also support certain young scientists who want to start a new initiative maybe so they should also be allowed to access funds and also quality of research has to be focused upon so not only do we talk about innovation here but we also talk about encouraging people to think out of the box to find problems to solutions and take up projects that are very global in nature for example even if you talk about climate change today and the use of ai to combat climate change is a very ongoing hot topic of discussion but not much really is accomplished in public institutions because there are restrictions so these restrictions have to be surmounted in order to find real life solutions to real life problems that's what the article talks about in the end it's about 2050 that should be the goal year or the estimated year until which we are able to fulfill our aspirations of becoming a top notch global economy but that comes only when we are giving a lot of funding a lot of support and a lot of freedom to our science and research sector that's what the article discusses now the third article for the day is coming from page 10 a page 10 of the hindu today was very remarkable you see majority of the important articles have been coming from page 10 today for some reason and here is the article that is in association with GS paper 3 this is about ecology environment and we talk about another milestone judgment of supreme court where the honorable court has said that forests are national assets and therefore they have a major contribution in our economy in our financial well being so the supreme court clearly said that there shall be no toleration of any state government trying to be careless with the use of forest land why has this article suddenly come up the article has come up in the background of a recent tussle 
of ideology between the Honorable Supreme Court and the government of Telangana, wherein the Supreme Court clearly held the state government of Telangana for having granted forest land to certain private individuals. This became the point of contention where the court chipped in and said that since forests are national asset and any damage to forest could in future lead not only to climate disasters but also it could mean a lot of financial burden on the nation and therefore no state government has a right to interfere with forest land it is sacrosanct and therefore the government has slapped a fine of rupees 5 lakh to the private people who are engaging in this act and also to the state government for having given this grant to the private individual in the first place. So here is the background of the article and also the state government has been told to conduct a strict inquiry against the forest officers who had said yes or who had nodded to ceding such forest land to private parties. This is the judgment and now the article talks about some fundamental problems that are going on with regards to forest management. Now, this fundamental problem is coming in the shape of the recent amendment act of the Forest Conservation Act. This amendment came in 2023 and ever since it has come, it has been raising eyebrows of environmental activists and people alike. Why? Because it is a very ambitious plan. It talks about promoting ecotourism at all costs. It talks about how international borders could also be used for creating ecological parks, more and more wildlife conservation areas, zoos, safaris, heritage parks, wildlife sanctuaries. Why? The government clearly says the intention is to promote wildlife awareness among people, definitely to boost the income of the country through nature, tourism, through ecotourism, and also to create a kind of responsibility among people and to create a kind of bond among ecology and individuals. That's one thing. But on the other hand, it is coming at a huge price. The trade-off here is that while you create an infrastructure in the shape of a zoo, a safari or any ecotourism infrastructure, you are compromising on ecology because most of these places which are heavily forested are centered around either river valleys or thick mountainous terrains. Now what happens whenever you create any infrastructure in such areas. These are vulnerable landscapes. Often we end up paying a bigger price, a bigger price in the form of overcrowding, in the form of pollution, in the form of a lot of waste and rubble that's created, in the form of commercialization of these places, interference in wildlife, as well as too much tourism derogates, completely degrades the natural habitats. We are trying to conserve them. But in the wake of conserving them, by creating too much modern infrastructure around them, we are in fact degrading them. So this is one thing that people have not found valid. Another reason why this 2023 Act was not appreciated by a lot of people is that it also allows government to give certain lands to private parties for eco-touristic development. Again, that's something that's not nice because in the form of, rather in the garb of ecotourism. The forest land could be used for a lot of exploitation, commercial exploitation and hence this act has been under scanner ever since it was amended in 2023. It has been widespreadly criticized because it has allowed the states to regularize encroachment in protected forest but also it is allowing the state to determine diversions of forest land into non-forest use. Similarly, criticized for allowing commercial exploitation and for creating infrastructural projects by protecting them from strict environmental clearance permits. So this is something that has not been taken well by the people. In fact, the article pitches that probably it's because of this lax policy that today the case in Telangana happened in the first place when the government officials will be empowered by this amendment act to deroute forest land for non-forest use. Naturally, such cases will keep happening very, very often. You never know in the long run it could also lead to some kind of commercial poaching or wildlife exploitation which as of now people cannot foresee. Another thing that the article talks about is significance of forest and climate change mitigation. The Honourable Supreme Court has also pointed out that as per a recent report from the Ministry of Environment and Forest, India's forests are serving as a major carbon sink. Now we all know that forest and trees are responsible for carbon sequestration. They release oxygen, 
by absorbing the additional carbon dioxide in the air. So they act as carbon sinks which are able to constantly pump fresh air and hence they protect us against greenhouse gases. So if the forests are carbon sink and they are, they are storing a heavy amount of CO2 or carbon dioxide, the more we protect them, the better contribution we are making against climate change. Similarly, the judgment also highlighted that economic value of carbon sequestration which the forests are doing in India today is about $120 billion dollars or about say, 6 lakh crores. So you imagine the hidden cost of destroying forests. It's unimaginable. Similarly, it says that already climate change has been creating a very, very bad dark shadow on India's economy. For example, a report by the Reserve Bank of India, which is very disturbing, says that macroeconomic impact of climate change in India would be critically dangerous. According to this report, climate change and a complete reversal in rainfall patterns. Now, day before yesterday, we were talking about how in the peninsular states in India, there has been an unusual heat wave. And in fact, there was something known as pre-monsoon or mango showers, which you might have studied in your NCRT geography. They are completely missing. They haven't happened this year. So this is clearly an evidence of climate change. Now, recently, we're also talking about the flooding that's going on in Dubai. So people are saying, how come deserts are getting flooded and how come? Areas with elevation are experiencing a complete dry spot. So all this is climate change, you know, and in fact, the dangers are many, many more. So here the RBI report also said the same thing, that changing rainfall patterns will cost about 2.8% of GDP by 2050. Now, this is an insane amount of money that's getting wasted only because of climate change. This money, which could have been used for so much productive expenditure, will go wasted in disaster management or in providing health care management, water management for the people who are impacted by climate change, typically the more vulnerable people. Similarly, by 2100, India would potentially lose about 3 to 10 percent of its GDP every year due to climate change. Now, this report is so disturbing. In fact, it's an eye wash. And this is what the quote has said, that we need an urgent call for climate leadership. So we need people to come and protect the climate. And here the state governments have a much larger role to play than previously imagined, that it is human duty to protect Earth. That's your planet and therefore human life. And therefore, any such action by the state governments in future, which is endangering a forest, it's a complete misinterpretation of the Amendment Act of 2023, forest management. And now with this, we'll proceed with another article. However, this is for prelims and the article talks about a very interesting discovery. As I said, once again, page 10, science and tech, it says how fossils of a very huge, a humongous prehistoric snake have been discovered in one of mines situated in the Kutch area of Gujarat. What does this discovery mean is the primary agenda of the article. So now this discovery has been created at Indian Institute of Technology, Rurki, and some young candidates have discovered certain fossils which are a testimony of a huge snake species which is Vasuki indicus, that's the name of the species of snake found, fossil found. The researchers have said that the discovery of this fossil point out to one of the largest snakes to have ever existed on the planet. And these fossils have been found in the Kutch area, particularly in the Panandro lignite mine in the Kutch region of Gujarat. And this fossil has been dated to be about, say, 47 million years old. So it's very, very old. At a, it's coming from a time which was referred to as Middle Eocene period. So the discovered snake Vasuki indicus belonged to an extinct variety of snake family which is referred to as the Matsudai snake. It is believed to have been a huge, an enormous creature, somewhere around 10 to 15 meters long. Now, why is this discovery suddenly so important? It is not just about finding a fossil. It is an interesting discovery indeed, but why is it UPSC relevant? Is because once they have discovered this species, the remains of fossils of this species of snake, it also helps us in many more ways. One, it will help us in creating a unique lineage of reptile specimen in India that belong to this particular Matsodai family of snakes. That's one thing. It will help us in tracking the lineage of this reptile. So that's, again, very, very useful. 
another thing it helps is in understanding the impact of temperature changes rather climate changes from one era to another and how they impact wildlife so that is a telltale sign that how this discovery could help us in fact in identifying the causes behind disappearance of many many species of reptiles so it will enable future research into climate change and its resultant impact on certain reptilian species so it is expected to also improve our understanding of how the maxodai species had evolved in the said middle eocene era also it will help us in understanding that during the time of high temperatures in the tropical climate regions how did these reptiles evolve what features did they in exhibit so this therefore would help us and it would contribute in understanding a variety of climate related impacts on large reptilian species that is the overall benefit of this study to this the next article again as i said page number 10 talks about how india has delivered first batch of brahmos missile supersonic missile to philippines it's not a new news but it is a new development just about a month back we had discussed in one of the articles that how philippines is one of the first consumer or one of the first nation to actually demand an embarkment from the brahmos supersonic missile that has been created with a joint venture between india and russia suddenly why is this news becoming so important because it is not just about philippines receiving the brahmos supersonic missile it is about how philippines is now adding up to its arsenal of missiles and defense systems and why suddenly so much expenditure and enthusiasm about its defense system now we all know the debate we all know the controversy regarding the south china see it has been all over the news even yesterday in fact so we know how philippines and china tussle is ongoing regarding islands such as the sprati island and many others in the region so to safeguard against chinese aggression this is a very very important development that how from india the first batch of brahmos missile was just yesterday delivered to philippines and the deal is about dollar 375 million worth in india it is an estimation that has come for three batteries of the shore based anti ship variant of the brahmos missile and now with this philippines has become the first customer of the joint venture missile that is created between india and russia the philippines is completely hooked on to its modernization program it is in fact upgrading its missile system as a part of horizon 2 phase of its revised armed forces modernization program it is coming in the wake of the ongoing tussle and the conflict in china sea the south china sea region between philippines and china so once functional these missile systems are expectedly set to enhance the defense capacities of philippines armed forces so that is the rationale here and recently in fact last year there was a visit to philippines by india's external affairs minister shri s jay shankar where the commitment from india to support and uphold a rule based fair and systematic international law and order in the south china sea in the indo pacific region was further reiterated and in that light India along with other like minded nations we could talk about US we could talk about Japan we could talk about Australia and all these who are actually rattled by China's growing aggression now there was one another news today in fact in the newspaper how China has created another base in one of its southern islands so you see the expansionist policy is creating waves of concern among amid the country who share the entire indo pacific so this support for philippines is again a very vital component of that and philippines navy has already taken systematic training from india in the usage of this missile system that was done just last year in the early part of last year in maharashtra in india and several countries like indonesia thailand have also shown huge interest in further importing the brahmos system and the discussions are already being done with regards to that now a quick note on brahmos so we know it's a joint venture between india's defense research development organization and russia's defense uh, corporation the missile has been named after two rivers the brahmaputra river of india and the moksva river of russia it can be launched from land sea subsea air and against surface and sea based selected 
identified targets. Now, India's entry into the missile technology regime system, the MTCR back in 2016, also led to extending or increasing the capacity of its missile range from 290 kilometers to 450 kilometers and further as we all know indian government has also been spending a lot of money investment is ongoing to create more and more capabilities in india's defense arsenal with this the next article of the day is also a very very interesting example of how this Lok Sabha election that's ongoing right now, the phase one was just completed yesterday and as per the newspaper reports, the turnout of the voters despite the severe heat wave was very, very encouraging. So about 64 to 68%, slightly different from various regions of the country. Now on that note, as we all know, you might have heard about certain unique tribal communities from Andaman and Nicobar Island. You might have heard about the Jaravas, the Shampans, the Onjis. So here we are talking about Shampan. So this is a PVTG. Now we know that in India we have various categories of tribal groups. We often talk about the denotified tribals. We talk about the scheduled tribe, which is a broader category. We do talk about the PVTG or the particularly vulnerable tribal groups now. On that note, let's also remember that it was the Dhibar Commission initially which had identified the number of particularly vulnerable tribal groups in India. Today it stands to be all India, say about 75 such tribes and Odisha is the state which has the largest accumulation of the PVTG group. They are identified on the basis of certain criteria, for example, stagnant or declining population, a very, very low level of literacy, pre-agriculture technology, as well as extreme social economic backwardness. On that note, we are talking about one such PVTG from the area of Andaman Nicoba. This is known as Shompin Tribal Community. A very interesting news has emerged that this community has voted for the first time in the ongoing Lok Sabha election phase one that was yesterday. And they live in the dense tropical forest of the great Nicoba Island, a very remote and isolated community overall. But seven members of the community have casted their franchisee. Very interesting because often we say that tribals still witness a low participation in mainstream political economic systems. So on that note, this could be a very, very promising effort at more assimilation and development and awareness among the tribals. And then the same article also highlights how as per the 2011 census data, only 229 members are existing in the Shompin community and where while the entire country is reported to have experienced a voter turnout of about on an average 64 percent this participation from such a unique indigenous community talks volumes about an enhancing expanding democracy so this was the revelation of this article to that the next snippet for the prelims is coming from page nine it says that how center has released Curriculum framework for Aganwadis. Now, we have often spoken about Aganwadis as government run preschools. Preschools are preliminary state schools that are typically meant for students from the age of 2 to 5. They are known as preparatory schools because they aim at primary nutrition, learning abilities, and some primary education. So, here they are providing free of cost education to members of community. All undertaken by the government at the government expense but also they provide certain other services such as nutritional counseling to parents of young children to sometimes vaccination and reproductive basic health care to pregnant women they also provide sometimes free supplements and free medical aid to people who are coming from vulnerable rather economically vulnerable backgrounds so in this regard a very interesting development has happened that indian government has for the first time released a systematic properly created framework curriculum for whom for these young students of Aganwadis. now normally the education would happen on a very ad hoc basis yes learning skills were getting imparted yes nourishment nutrition counsel was being given but there was a lack of proper curriculum as it is existing in primary private schools and therefore many parents were not interested in sending their kids to Aganwadi. Certain other reports by surveys done from various NGOs and the government also highlighted that how students who have attended Aganwadi, although a good thing is that they do normally continue up to higher education, 
But the sad problem is that most of these students lack the kind of reading and writing ability that are normally seen with students in private schools. So to combat this problem and with its commitment to the new or the national education policy 2020, here the government comes with something that is known as Adhar Sheila. Now in Hindi, the word Adhar means foundation or base. So here, the name of this new curriculum designed by the Ministry of Women and Child Development, the MWCD, under the aegis of the government is known as Adhar Sheila. Adhar Sheila is centered around creating a reading, writing, learning program for young students from the age group of 3 to 5, all those who are attending Aganwadi. Now, let's remember that there are about 14 lakh Aganwadi schools in India which cater to village to village and take care of the education of generally those community members who either cannot afford private schooling or who have lack of access to schooling themselves. Most of the times the parents are working in the unorganized sector or they are completely unaware about the necessity of literacy. And hence, these children will now achieve professional training, proper curriculum right from the beginning of life. So, this article therefore says that this national curriculum for early childhood care and education, whose name is Adhar Sheila, has been created and it will take care of children from three in fact, to six years of age, in the very first year, the children will actually be taught the preschool learning introduction. For example, basic numbers or basic sounds of alphabets. Similarly, they shall be taught motor skills, better listening skills, or for that matter, nutrition. Some free meals shall also be provided. So all these things shall be done. Eventually, we shall try to promote foundational literacy and also take care of pregnant mothers and children so that, as we all know, the entire mission behind Aganwadi is that better health outcomes lead to better learning outcomes. So with that, the curriculum will also take care of basic learning in numeracy, alphabets, in vernacular languages, as well as in small, small arts of motor skill development such as taking care of whether the children are fully developed or they need some medical intervention. So that awareness should also be spread. The component is very, very varied and dynamic. It talks about teaching children how to explore through the use of material, learning material, sensory material, sometimes nature walks and exploration of plants and insects, conversation, storytelling, role play acting, all these are typically considered as stages of child growth, even in medical science. So this shall also be applied here. Similarly, how are children's reflexes? How well can they think and respond to various stimulus? That is also something that's been taken care of. Similarly, singing nursery rhymes, exposing children to hot and cold temp temperature objects to make them uh, you know, understand the difference between sensory feelings. Similarly, art, craft, shape, cutting, paper and all these celebrating local festivals, enjoying various kinds of foods, explaining children the health component of food. All these will be a part of the curriculum. Eventually, the last eight weeks shall focus, up, focus upon taking some kind of assessment or survey to understand how well is the child performing, how successful has been the system. For implementation, teachers will be trained. Under the portion B, Padhai B. Nutrition will be taken care of and so will education B. And this will take care of how to train Aganwadi workers, typically women, in undertaking and actually implementing this program across various villages. Around six, seven, five, eight Aganwadi workers from 32 states have been trained already. And for the young new joinees, the training is going on. So a very interesting development there. And now the last article of the day is page 10. This is international relations. And again, this is a development, not a fresh piece of news really, that how Israel who was being cajoled, requested by various countries like the EU, various countries of EU, UK particularly, also by the US to not respond to Iran's missile attack, which had happened just about two days back. And Israel at that time acted rather diplomatically by not committing to any verdict. It said that we shall do the Prime Minister Netanyahu said, we shall do whatever it takes to protect ourselves and we shall respond to Iran's provocation, but on the right time. So it seems like the right time had come because just yesterday, the late hours, 
Israel has responded and it has hit back in the central province of Isfahan in Iran, which has caused major turmoil and major rescue efforts in the region. So this is creating an alarming situation for the world today as we have seen so many battles that are ongoing. So as one ends, the other just begins. So already there is the Israel-Palestine tussle that's ongoing, which is also experiencing a stalemate situation. There is no peace that is really to be seen very soon. In fact, today there was another article in the Hindu which speaks about how Israel is completely refusing the two-state solution of the UN, which shall divide the given territory between Palestine and Israel. Since Israel is completely in denial, it shall cause problems in future as well. It also highlighted the kind of paradox that exists in the global systems. For example, Palestine was offered some kind of a temporary membership and seat in the UN. But at the end of the day, there was no use because despite having a recognition as a separate country, many countries such as Israel refuse to even acknowledge it. So what exactly is going on? The tussle seems to be not concluding anytime soon. And in that wake now that Iran and Israel are also experiencing a kind of conflict situation where both the countries are targeting each other. Iran had said that if Israel attacks, it shall see unparalleled provocation from our side. So now it is up to the world to actually gorge and see what shape does the conflict take. Now, in a quick timeline, if you see, on April 1, Iran said that we are responding to the strike on our diplomatic building, which had killed many people when Israel had attacked Iran consulate in Syria. To that Iran had launched about 300 missiles at Israel. Israel said that we have transcepted. We have incepted more than 99. So mostly there was not much damage done except for a little damage here and there at some of our defense arsenal. And then just yesterday, Israel once again has attacked Iran. So now with this situation, the world leaders are completely in shock to see what developments take place in Middle East. And despite US insistence, insistence by many countries, including India actually, to Israel to act with calm and to act with a little bit more diplomatic maturity. We are seeing that both the countries are already in the process of attack and counter-attack. So naturally, the area is experiencing a lot of instability and the future developments we shall all see in times to come. This is what the article talks about. And now we can quickly have a look at two main questions that have been based on our today's articles. The first one says, examine the geopolitical implications, impact of India's delivery of Brahmo supersonic cruise missile to Philippines and its broader significance in the Indo-Pacific region. So we just need to briefly talk about what is Brahmos and how Philippines is the first customer of the supersonic cruise system. We should also talk about why is Philippines completely into modernizing its defense arsenal in the background of the South China tussle, as well as in the broader context of Indo-Pacific that how like-minded countries are gearing up whether it be through naval exercises, whether it be through defense exchanges, through dialogues, how to combat or how to counter China's expansionist agenda. That's the core of the question. The second question talks about how discuss the significance of national curriculum for early childhood care and education 2024. The article that we just spoke about the central government, the Ministry of Women and Child Development and how they have created a systematic professional curriculum for young children aged, aged 3 to 6 known as Adhar Sheila, a mission that creates foundational literacy skills among young children so that they can compete with their counterparts who are studying in private schools who are getting already more systematic preparatory school guidance. So here, what is the relevance of this? And in the context of preschool learning, what are the what is the potential of this Adharshila program on educational landscape of India? It is tremendous. We know that as per various researches and various data, it is the children who study Anganbadi. They are much likely to continue up till higher education without much dropout in between. We also understand that Aganwadi is not just aimed at child education, but also aimed at child nutrition. Given the high rate of child stunting and child wasting in India, given the high rate of hunger and malnourishment in India, it is critical that children B 
be given some kind of nutritional guidance and supplementation in school itself. Again, we are talking about the same thing. It will help us in two ways, better health outcome and definitely better education outcome as well. So that's something that we need to talk about. Also, we could mention how it helps in creating better access to reproductive health for women, better family planning and overall a better health status for young women in reproductive age group. So with that, we can cover this question. And now on that note, I shall take your leave for today. Thank you very much for staying with us during this session. I hope you were benefited from this. And I shall see you soon with many such interesting sessions in the future. So take care and thank you.